Hello, hello. Hi, Janet. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. Thank you, too. Uh, hi again, Gladys. Uh, it's very lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful, you know, podcast that you're doing, inspiring others. You always inspire me. And so it's such an honor to share the platform with you and, um, yeah, and to be here today. Thank you for, you know, allowing me. I know you have interviewed some really amazing people in the past and, I, I don't know. I just feel so humbled and honored. Um, I hope this is going to be a fruitful and wonderful conversation that, you know, somebody can have one or two things to take away. Amazing. <laughs> you are inspirational, Janet. And I know we'll talk about your story <laughs> and all these things you do, tech consulting and all this entrepreneurship stuff that you do. But tell us where you are in the world at the moment. Uh, thanks. Um Gladys. So yeah, again, like Gladys said, I, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Janice Chepkoge, uh, Rotich Waweru. Um, I am a mother, I'm a wife, I'm an entrepreneur, I am proudly African. I what else? I I love technology and I love entrepreneurship. So yeah, where I am in my life right now, I'm in Orlando, Florida, and currently I <coughs> I am working on a tech, you know, I'm a tech consultant, basically, as a software engineer, I took some time off from the corporate world to start my own consulting company. And that's what I do, along with other passions on the side as well. Hopefully, we get some time to talk about that. Yes, we will have all the time to talk about that. But before, before, we, before we come to the present moment... In, in Florida and what you're doing as a tech consultant and how you found yourself as a software engineer, we can go all the way back to, and you mentioned that you were born and raised in Kenya. Where were you born and raised? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think it's always important to reflect back and think, you know, where did it all start from? <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I was born in a very small village, actually very remote village. It's called Lutiet. Um, maybe the highlight of that village is, if you all know Conceslas Kipruta, he was literally my neighbor. I grew up with him, the really? athlete. I think, yes, I grew up with Conceslas. He's yeah, good friend of mine. Um, but yeah, that's where I, I was born. And then I was, that is in Nandi County. Then we moved um, to a place near Moy University Cases. That's where we live now. We moved when I was, I think, in standard two or three. So that's where I grew up uh, for the most part. But I went to boarding school <laughs> for a lot of my, actually all of my life, really. From okay. when I was in nursery, if you can right. imagine. So my life really started nursery school at a small school deep in Nandi County called All Saints Kebulonic Academy. It's in Uko Karibu na the forest, the North Nandi Forest. It's in Sangalo, if anybody knows. Baraton sides even further, further. Mm. Those days were tough, <laughs> if I can remember. I remember there were no roads to get there. It was like, it was impossible. Now it's much better. But that's where my journey began at All Saints. I guess my educational academic journey at All Saints Kiblonik. And then I went to Alliance Girls High School from All Saints. And then I came to the U.S. for my college. And that's where I got my degree to become um my degree in computer science, where I became a software engineer. I went to a school in Boston. The name is Tufts University. Really enjoyed my time. Had a lot of fun, challenges as well. Wasn't easy studying computer science. And remember a village girl like me? I am proudly a village girl, actually. I love it in the village all the time. But yeah, studying computer science wasn't easy, but we made it. And I then became a software engineer, started my job at Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank, I started it was like a grand entrance into my career because we were taken to London, you know, for training for a whole month, which was yeah. wonderful. I got to visit Oxford then. I had yeah. my friend there. Her name was Jessica Mugadza. She had gotten into Oxford, so I got to visit her while in London. And then I came back 
started my job at Deutsche Bank um, after a month in 2017, <coughs> a month of training in London in North Carolina. So I started my job there, worked there for about two years. Then I moved to the Silicon Valley where I worked for, you know, the largest retail. You are moving too fast. Okay. Okay, please so we'll stop me. It's we'll post okay. there in Silicon Valley. Okay. <laughs> I want to know all the details, right? So okay, sure. The way to and the first the first detail that is missing before we pick up from Silicon Valley. Because I know there are some parents or some students who who will be watching um from mm-hmm. primary school or high school. Mm-hmm. Personally, my story my story kind of went <laughs> mini viral. Uh, in Kenya because I had 298 marks in KCP and then when people compare to where I am there is like a lot of difference right so I think it's also important to measure wh- how, what marks you scored in, pri- in primary school KCP and then we'll quickly move to high school oh thank you oh wow yeah. uh, I was actually one of the top students I was the top girl in Nandi County I had 433 marks from what? the little known school, yeah, yeah. Um, even I was in the newspaper, so yeah, <laughs> I remember I was number sixty nine <laughs> in Rift Valley. Yeah, that's have, how I got to join. Do you have yes. a, a snapshot of that paper? I will ask my mom. I'm sure it's somewhere at home. I'll find it for sure, okay. and then I, yeah. But what I want to say is. Uh, from that primary school, people would think we had all it took. I, if I could tell you that we used to, to kichwa, like our mode of transportation for getting water from the river was four donkeys that we had. Yeah. Yeah. We used to use pressure lumps to read. We didn't have electricity throughout my time. And it was just, I think, we, I worked really hard. I, I think I remember that. I would not recommend anybody waking up at 4 a.m. and all that. But I remember I, st- I, I was a very studious kid for sure then. Yeah. Still oh, but- am. I love reading. Um, yeah. However, I think what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter the resources or where you come from. It's just if you have the focus and I hope you also have some of some guidance because my teachers were really into great like hard work. I feel like my foundation was built while I was at All Saints. Like the installation of hard work was that that was instilled in me at All Saints, which was that that school very remote. I remember going to school. My parents <coughs> Like we didn't even have like proper transportation. My I grew up from a very my t- my parents were teachers, so we didn't have too much. Um, mm-hmm. And so we would wait on those kids who are going to school some, and then we like get h- hitchhike, and then yeah. to Funga Shule sometimes yeah. to li- to to Napitia Mugu to Kirude Nyumbani because you know we didn't have like transport to go home and sometimes it was hard and sometimes mnakatazwa then you kind of have to figure out how do how do we get home and so grateful for my brother he was slightly older than me and i think he laid the foundation and kind of helped me you know get through yeah. this yeah um and also a lot of credit goes to my parents because no matter what like it was always a home of excellence (laughs) and my dad in primary school was very (coughs) keen on my grades if I didn't score let's say I scored a 90 out of 100 in one subject he would come and sit me down and say why did you score a 90 like what was the challenge is it that you did not understand the concept was it like a a small mistake or like you know we make careless mistakes so he wanted me to analyze and look through my grades and think what could I improve if it was a concept that I didn't understand yeah he would make sure that I got the teacher's guidance and that almost carried out carried over to high school too where um yeah so that's primary school so my parents my teachers were very like very uh you know good and um into hard work 
So we mm. walked really hard. I walked really hard. We walked really hard, actually, in that school. I don't know how it is nowadays, but that was the school. <laughs> then, wow. Despite then, all the challenges. Yeah, no, well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Because it's not, it's not an easy thing, like, from from a small school with those challenges and scoring really high. <laughs> like, even ranking top 100 in, in the nationals. So, yeah. You went to Alliance Girls, you mentioned. Correct. Now, so, uh, yeah. How go was ahead, it? Go ahead. How, how was it there? Do you, do you remember life in high school? Like, memorable moments? Maybe good moments and bad moments? Yeah. Uh, high school was really fun. I would say that was one of my best lives. It was a big upgrade. <laughs> I know some people go to Kenyan high school, so they're like, oh, my God. For me, it was a big upgrade because in my primary school, we didn't even have any food to be, you know, we couldn't carry any food. It was a, it was a big, yeah. Yeah, yeah. At a shilingi moja, you were not allowed to have that. We didn't yeah. have bread in the morning. We, we only took like a cup of tea. I don't advocate for this kind of you know, education system, passive, but I'm just saying it was very different from, from my, you know, from my primary school. So going to a land where we had bread, we could carry food. It wasn't much, but we could carry food to school. And then we, you know, it was, it was like freedom for me. It was, it was like, hey, I mean, I should just come back. Yeah. <laughs> Having come from a very remote school. Uko. Yeah. And also, I have to mention, Gladys, that I really, really wanted to go to Alliance. And my time to go to Alliance was met, was post-election time. Mm. So why are- it was 2007. Yeah, but why, why did 2007, you want- I I really wanted to go there because... My best friend had gone there who was before me. And that's why I say company, your company is very important, especially for kids who are listening or watching this. Your company is very important. They inspire you. And I give a, a lot of thanks and credit to my best friend who went to Alliance. She was a class ahead of me. So I really wanted to go to Alliance. And she had been inspired by a, another friend who had gone to Alliance, I think, four years prior, prior to that. So it was like a chain. And... Thank God, all the, I guess, her, like her best friend, my friend and I, we've ended up in the U.S. somehow. Wow. Don't, don't tell me why or how. (laughs) But anyway, that's beside the story. And that's why I say company, like really defines you for those parents and students and anybody watching this. And then, so I went to Alliance. It was, it was really fun. It was a big upgrade for me, but I still had to work really hard. Remember now I'm from a little school, but you're going to meet with kids from McKinney school, kids from, and all Riara, all the top schools, private and public schools from Nairobi. And so I remember my ranking position at Alliance was 47 out of 200, which was, I would say, Kind of, you know, you, you're known being the top. You're known of, you know, being the top student. And yeah. then now it's like the creme de la creme, everybody. Yeah. Was that in Form 1 or in later? That was in Form 1. That okay. was in Form 1. Must, yeah, must, so I... Uh, sorry? Must have shocked you to, to, to oh, not... Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, it was hard. And I remember my roommate then was... Um, She was from one of the top schools. She had beaten me. And so in the first semester, she used to kind of not treat me too well, look down on me. You know, I was from the village too. And so I feel like that aspect was a bit of a challenge for me at Alliance. But it also was defining for me because it really inspired me to work even harder and to think, okay, we're here. We're taught by the same, um, you know, professors, uh, teachers. I mean, I could call them professors here in college. We're taught yeah. by the same teachers. We learn the same material. If I can study this stuff, I can pass, right? I remember yeah. my first test in the first semester was, uh, you know, she beat me. A lot of people beat me. But then the next semester, I worked really hard. And I was like, you know what? I can figure this out. And so I started moving to the top. And, yeah. and then I started to actually be among the top students in my in my class and so that was like wow it is possible and Mm -hmm. I think while at Alliance it's uh 
one challenge is definitely the class the classism which is unfortunate part of our society in Kenya and I hope we could just get rid of it and just coexist but it, there was like the rich kids versus all of us from you know the village the poor kids <laughs> kind of and so they would all form cocoons and you kind of felt like you didn't belong to some extent but i yeah. think what really helped me was you know being you know still scoring highly so they they, they had no choice but to respect me <laughs> yeah and then yeah. i i kind of learned that hey you know in life anybody can get actually get it you just got to work hard i know not everybody is accorded all the support and help there is some privilege that comes with that kind of thing but i just want to tell anybody listening out there that it's it's possible and once you have asserted your you know your what once you know what what you want and once you work really hard and you can produce everybody respects you for that and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later with being in the tech industry especially in silicon valley and being a black and being african and being a woman and all that and you you just kind of find yourself being the only one there and you just mm. have to still fight to you know find your place or like take your place on the table yeah. but i i just one detail to add there is um uh i guess when i was i i mentioned that this was post election and i i really really wanted to go to alliance no matter what this was the time when people were negotiating should you go to a public school like close by because you couldn't go there was no way i'm from eldoret my school is in kikuyu i'm kalenjin the other side is kikuyu there's no way i was going to mm-hmm. i was going to get through but hey like i say whenever something is yours come on yako yako if i could put it if it's yours it's yours because yeah. somehow out of all that chaos it happened that my cousin was walking and living in kikuyu in the middle of all that chaos and then it happened that my another uncle of mine whom i give so much credit and thanks to was also living in kikuyu and he was a police officer there he's he has transferred <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's how we were able to organize this were the times ulikuwa bado mna escorted na nini na police all the yeah. way so yeah. so we were, it was really bad i remember when we were going through timboroa and there was like freshly burnt houses like that was My dad I don't remember too well but my dad says that when I saw that I just kept quiet I think that's when it hit me like people had been coming home uh, to tell my dad that hey maybe you should reconsider this they even sent an old man I mean he's may he rest in peace who was my really good friend to come and try and convince me mm. to you know choose more girls for example but I was like no 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 alliance is where i'm going i don't care yeah. <laughs> i think when yeah. i saw those b- freshly burnt ashes is when i started to think like oh maybe this is serious <laughs> in my own naivete but my dad was with me he took me we were to kangojewa we were being waited on by his um you know my cousin on the other end and, the, and my uncle who was a police officer who just i had never known we had never had an idea they were uko but god puts people in your in you know when you do the right thing god puts the right people on your path and so they can direct you and i can relate all of my experiences and you know success by such uh, you know such coincidences which will segue into how i even got to the us as well it was just by sheer luck so yeah. that was my life at alliance yeah <laughs> Yeah, so that was my life at Alliance, I know. And feel free to ask me any questions if I if I skip through anything. No, um I I want I want us to talk about after um, and the reason why I'm asking this uh just just so that students high schoolers and 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 other students we can see all these possibilities and so i want to know how did you know about the, the how did you know about the this possibility of flying out after, oh yeah all right Th- that's yeah that was after high school that's a really good question and um i think 
my experience versus other Bushirans, Bushirans is like those who went to Alliance might be different. Um, yeah. So I, I had had some people going out. I had seen some people go out after, but I felt like it was resolved. Again, there's this class thing <laughs> to some extent, and there was some, you know, teacher's favorite. So you had to be of certain, meet certain criteria, then you could be selected. So for me, uh, in fact, I remember seeing an SAT book going around my class and again, some group of people, they just didn't want to share. And I remember telling, I borrowed it. I remember it was break time. I, there was a 15 minutes window. We used to have tea break where you go eat your hot chocolate and bread uh, at 10. So, and it's like 15 to 30 minutes window there. So I borrowed the book. I was like, you know, I won't go for my tea break so I can just at least look at this. What is this SAT? What is it all about? And then I remember um, one of the girls who had the book just before break, she literally came back 15 minutes later and told me, oh, I was first in line to get this book. So I just had to give it away and I didn't even get a chance. And I remember telling myself, watch out of your US <laughs> However, yeah, yeah. however, mm. so then there was this guy who had come to, uh, talking about South Africa. So that was, I was like, all right, maybe South African tender. I actually applied, got into some South, I can't even remember which school it was, uh, South African school. I remember taking the admission letter to my dad and he looked at it and he told me, he actually did the math and said, you know what, I can really help you to go to South Africa for one year because it was like a million. However, what will happen to my other siblings? Because they're also in, one was in college, the others were in uni and, and all that. So it was like, we can sell everything that we have, support you for one year, but everything else is going to suffer. Mm. And we just, kind of evaluated it with him and he just told me like i i honestly i would love for this to be yours but i can't like i see ways and i guess this comes to being just compassionate with your parents if you're a kid over there and just understanding and and just being comfortable with it and i didn't know god had you know more plans for me uh you know later so i i had to give up that that south africa um, opportunity and that was in january i had just finished kcse and we the results were not even out but i still got the admission <laughs> however nikaka nikaka and then uh, results came and again i was um, i was among the top i was in top 100 kenya which okay. is so what? exciting <laughs> yes what number what number which year was this 2011 so i guess 2012 okay. so yes i was again in in top 100 in kenya um uh, i was overall you know they used to rank boys and girls overall yeah. i was 99 but for the girls i was number 33 three, three. yeah so i'm so proud of myself i guess maybe I those are my highlights about this <laughs> well now you know. <laughs> well done, though. Well done, man. Thank Congrats. You. <laughs> but that took a lot of hard work, and you, as you can see, like challenges here, there, and I, I just, I had very good teachers too, who were very supportive, and they would always tell me, "You're my A student," and so that just like, I don't want to disappoint this. I'm counted as one of the A students, so that's how I did. And also my dad, both of my parents, my dad and my mom. My mom was always the soft touch. You get everything that you want, kind of. My dad was a strict one where you don't get everything. Like, he would come to school, literally. Niwale, my dad's wana kuja shule na gazette. I love how, you know, and you can contrast that with kids from very rich top ministers, PSs that I went to school with and Wange Kujana tent. <laughs> you know, they come with a whole tent seated on the field. Now we too, eh we'll continue babako. My dad me kuja to hapo na na yogurt yeah. na bananas. I remember that was his thing. At least he upgraded <laughs> from nothing <laughs> from Gazetti to to yogurt yeah. and bananas. Yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, it was it yes. was just fun. I had a very good best friend too there. Her name was Ivy, and 
what I, Ivy was from a well-to-do family too, and she taught me a lot, and I, I'm, I'm very grateful for having met her. And so what she did, when whenever they brought her food, she would share with me, like they would bring her yogurt, chicken, chips, everything. In a land, there was a rule where you don't, you can't keep food more than, you know, after the visiting day, you have to finish all the food. Tell it all the food, but you have to finish it before end of the day. <laughs> so, um, but she yeah. still really generously shared all that food with me. And so I got to enjoy the other side of life and kind of had a taste of, you know, what good life or what the other side of life was. Um so, but anyway, my dad was very strict. My mom would, whenever my mom would come, she would visit me occasionally and she would bring me maybe slightly more. She would try, but it wasn't as elaborate still. Because remember, Atatuk, we didn't get, well, we were not raised with all this stuff. Um, but we survived. However, yeah. with academics, my dad would make sure yeah. he was the number one parent, number one parent to get to school so mm. he could like mm. talk to every teacher of my in all of the subjects that I was taking and he would go I remember I used to struggle a little bit with English not a little bit actually a lot I used to struggle a lot with English it wasn't my strongest subject and we would go and sit with the my teacher um my English teacher and say, how can she, how can you help her? How can you be helped? Like I even had to say, how can I be helped? What is going on? Like, is there anything that they can do? Can I, can you, can I do extra, you know, extra exercises so it, she can grade it? And my teachers were very good and very understanding. And that's the drive. As a student, it's not everything you should expect from parents or teachers. There's also your part to put in your part of the hard work if it means if you're struggling with a certain subject if you think hey could have been you this one uh, you know for me i used to do those extra exercises just and take it to the teacher to like look over it for me and i, I think that's what really contributed to the success of what i had to do so if i were you know if your teachers are willing and i know a lot of good teachers are usually very willing to support good hard-working genuine students I, I have never seen a teacher who shuns over student because they have done some extra work. So if you have the chance to put in that effort, just do it because your teachers see the effort and they support you. So that's what I did at Alliance and my parents, my dad, always there to yeah. also, you know, make sure that I am... I, I am getting what I want. I'm getting the support. If there were no books, he bought me all the books that I needed and... The other thing also was Alliance was very good because they would give these gifts to students like best in best in mathematics, best in, they would give vouchers like 200, I don't know, 500. I don't remember this very well. I should have taken pictures of those vouchers. Those ones are, is what I actually used to buy yeah. most of my books. Like I have a lot of textbooks that I bought myself from those vouchers from school. And so that really helped me, you know, if there was a book that I knew like was good for me and na kulikuwa na watu wenye kona those books but some people don't just want to share <laughs> so that gave me a chance to buy myself the books and I I hope parents and somebody can be of support and I think a lot of people can you know when you say I really really need this book somebody some good wisher if you really don't have the means yeah. or the opportunity some well wisher somewhere might be listening and they might be willing to just buy you that book so it's that extra effort um to to excel that I put in I was I got all my A's I was meant to go study I really did not like biology that much, but I was meant to go study medicine after. I, I imagine like any other student you applied for, you applied for for unis in Kenya. Did you apply for unis in Kenya? I, th I think that was mandatory. So yes, I applied. I got into Nairobi University because I wanted to be so far away from home. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and, then, and, and then anyway, it happened. I think you had asked me, what, how did I get to America? Yeah. So my results came and I, I, sorry, I digressed a bit. My results came, I got an A and I was in town with my dad trying to figure out, okay, 
you know, you have passed very well. I think I was, yeah, like I said, I was the top student. Everybody was happy and all. Um, so I did not want to study medicine. I wanted to study something science, uh, no, something mathematics related. I think I wanted to do actuarial science, but my dad really, really wanted me to study medicine. So anyway, after a very big fight, I was like, all right, I'll go study this medicine. And then there was, you know, talk of, you know what, what can you, maybe you can, maybe there's somebody, I think he had had there's somebody who could help kids, you know, go to go abroad to the US or something like that. So one day he was like, okay, let's go meet this person i i still don't know where it was and who it was one day uh, my dad wanted to take me to meet this person in town in eldoret uh, who i think he had had could help, knew somebody who knew somebody that was helping kids go abroad to the u.s sonic size on me we're just walking along the streets of eldoret and uh, my dad just ran into one of his longtime friends. They, they had grown up together. He comes from Ukokaribuna, where I was born. And they had not seen each other. And it's like, as they were chatting, it was like, oh, who's this? Oh, this is my daughter. What is she doing? You know, the usual conversations that parents have. What is she? Oh, mieno. I guess in direct translation in Kale, mieno, iene. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then um, my dad's like, she just finished KCSE. Ali Patanini, what did she score? She's like, she scored is. Oh, okay, that's really good. I I know somebody. Oh, there's a friend of mine I know who was here. I, I think he was buying some spare parts or in a Kinyozi or something. It was somewhere, I remember, in Apple LD. And it was like, let's wait for him. Maybe we can talk to him. Oh, and uh, lo and behold, the the friend to my dad's friend was uh, Professor Mike Boyd, the founder of Kensup. Wow! Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> what, what do you call that? Is that luck? Is that serendipity? I know. Is that God? I, exactly. I know, and, and and that's why for me, I feel like when you do all the right things, you know, the universe just aligns and you know works for you. So, yeah, it happened. That was Mike Boyd, the founder of Kensup. And Kensup, for those who don't know, is a program that takes really top students and it helps them apply for scholarships and get admissions to top universities here in the U.S. Applications are open, by the way. Today, they should be closing soon. So if you can, please apply, especially if you scored A's, uh, A minus. Um, I think with, with uh, there is a requirement that you should have scored a B, a B stand in English. But please apply and look out for it. For those who are in high school, just aim to do that. And um, I, if somebody can side chat me, if or you know get in touch, and I can share more information about the program. So I met anyway. Back to my story. I met Mike Boyd. Mike Boyd. I, I had carried my result slip that day. So it was like, wow, like I saw so I got to show him because, you know, that's what he wanted to look at. And then he was like, oh, you know what? Let me scan your transcript and send it to, you know, to the program. So actually, that's how I got to know of the program of Kensup um, by sheer luck, sheer chance and, and all. And the long story short, so I he scanned. I was called for the interview later. It was very instrument, instrumental for me because he even, um, you know, he guided me. I mean, he started guiding me through, you know, starting to think and prepare for this. Alkwana SAT tutorials at his house. Like, because he, he's from Kesez and I'm not from far off yeah. from there. So, like, major thanks to, to, you know, Professor Mike Boyd. Without him, I wouldn't be where I am. And, yeah. you know, may God bless him a lot. That is uh, shout out to him. Yeah. And so I got into Kensup later. I mean, the process is rigorous. I don't want to go into the details. Yeah. But, yeah. No. That's how it, that happened. We will not go into details of Kensup. <laughs> But I know there are some students who are currently applying or who will apply mm -hmm. now that they know there is that a possibility. What is what, what yeah. you should have in mind? Just like one piece of advice to them, to the students who are applying to cancer. Of course, um, my piece of advice is uh, 
show your you know all roundedness i mean that's just still a requirement for all the top universities that kensap will be applying here it's not just of course there's academic excellence that's number one but then number two like do you have any leadership qualities do you have any extracurricular activities like what's your background why do you deserve this it's um so if you can demonstrate all that um, leadership and extracurricular and ulikuwa CU, ulikuwa deep drama, those are good good things. And also for those in high school, it's not just about the books. Make sure you also do extracurricular activities to enhance your profile um, from high school and even... I know we'll be talking later about uh, you know colleges yeah. and applying to masters and all that. Yeah, yeah. I have a yeah. We'll talk about that and how how I cannot underscore how important extracurricular and just you know beyond just being excellent with your books. Yeah, I think that those things will serve you well even later in life, and probably that's why they look for such things. <laughs> and I think it's usually more about why should they take a chance on you uh why should they take a chance on you and not somebody else yeah. like do you have potential uh you know to make a great impact mm -hmm. um, yeah so i think those are things to you should sell yourself in that in that way okay okay yeah. then through cancer you left kenya in 20 uh, 2013 2013 yeah and, so it took yeah. so i finished my kcse 2011 I results came out 20, 2012 in June, I guess yeah. March. Yeah. And then the whole process of cancer usually starts around July, so two months of training. It's about three months camp, like like rigorous, you know, training. You have to do your sit your SATs, SAT one, SAT twos, and apply to schools before November. By November, you have applied to schools. For most of us, I got my de decision by December. I remember December 25th or 26th there. I had I had gotten like full scholarship to study at Tufts University. Oh. So that's that's usually how the program runs. And then it's usually for the for the fall semester, which is you know the next year in September. Yeah. So I came here in August of 2013. 2013. And then you mid August in August in Tufts. University in Massachusetts. Yes. And you decided to study. Yes. Was it computer science or software engineering? So I studied computer science. Uh, and, and again, it goes back, you know, I had had this big fight with my dad to study, you know, um, medicine. Yes. So I had, I guess he had convinced me that medicine was a thing. So in Kayenda, I was pre-med. Of course, here, if you know the program, you cannot go directly to medical school. So you have to do classes that pre-qualify you to go the medicine track. Hey, nearly two classes, biology, chemistry. Yeah. Semester two, ikana chemistry, ikana kunilemea. Yeah. But again, I was very fortunate to have a friend. Um, again, I am telling you, all my life, God has just put the right people in my path yeah. somehow. I had a friend who went to Harvard and... He was telling me how he regrets not having tried, at the very least, taking computer science. He was, so he told me, just go take a class, see if you like it. Mm. See if you like it. If you don't like it, it's okay. You can just keep doing what you're doing. Mm. I'm telling you, I did, like, when I was starting, I wasn't even good at typing. <laughs> I remember I had to handwrite my my essays so that I could then type because typing was not I couldn't think and type. I mean, coming from the village, yeah. you know, no access to computers and all that. But yeah, hey, yeah. And then here I'm telling myself I didn't end up so many computers yeah. at, at the computer science. Yes. However, I took the class and oh my god, it blew my mind. Yeah. I loved it so much. I was like, this is what I want to do. Like I declared my major in my second semester after joining because like, I just fell in love. I remember one of my intro to computer science professor explaining how with computer science, you can program how to make reservations of uh, on planes. And I was like, oh, my God, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I want to build that program that is for reserving seats on a plane. I think maybe it's from my fantasy when I was young. I wanted to be a pilot, but... No, mm -mm. I didn't want to be a pilot because I don't like flying that much. 
<laughs> However, like just being able to produce those programs is like wow. And then we had projects that just it wasn't I'm not a memorizing person, I'm more of an understanding and then I create like I'm more systematic <laughs> in my approach of learning. And so I felt like computer science, I don't need to memorize. I just need to learn the basics and then, uh, you know, I can produce, you know, a, a software for this. So I felt like, wow, this is it. So that's when I declared my major after taking just one class. Luckily, I, it, it didn't fall through. Yeah. <laughs> the other classes were harder. They were really hard because now I was in on track with people who have been coding since they were like 11 and again this goes to parents if you have kids and you you have the opportunity to expose them to coding please 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 at an early age do that i have done a few things here and there with the community here especially when i was in the bay area just trying to introduce young kids especially young girls to you know programming and through robotics and things like that yeah so highly encourage um if you have the opportunity to do that please do it from a young age because tafika hapo or you fika whenever and you're with kids who've been coding since they were born mm. <laughs> i mean their parents are ceos of uber and all that so like and then you have to compete with them of course that's a huge learning curve yeah I want to release a maswali classical like, huh? Yeah. Nimesikia nini hata ujui kitu. But I'm telling you, it's sheer hard work, a lot of hard work, and you know, and just mimi nilikuwa na shinda computer lab. I think there is one picture of me and my friend Tumelala on the bench, just from being in the computer lab for the whole night, just working on computer science project. It's not an easy, easy path, but it's very, very, very rewarding in the end. Mm-hmm. So I think you kind of choose, because most of us, all of us, me and my friends, whom we were in that path, we all got jobs straight out of college. Yeah. In fact, our internships turned out to be full-time offers and that's what really set us up for, you know, for what we are today. We're still going. We're not there yet, yeah. but yeah. No, I mean, it's good you brought you brought that up because I know there are so many, um, let me just talk about Kenyan students that I've met in the US mm-hmm. and they are studying uh, <laughs> F1 visa. Yes. Yes, yes and yes. they want to know, so from your... Um, I think mostly they want to know like what are the opportunities, especially for international students, if you're studying in the mm-hmm. US, like how should you prepare yourself to stand a chance, maybe to get a sponsorship and get a job if you want to stay there or if you want to come back yeah. well and good. So from your from your experience, how was it? Like um how, how was landing? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um and I think maybe we need to talk about it more <laughs> because it's not to me. Some parts were very stressful. It's a very stressful thing to go through. Even, I mean, I was very fortunate. I, my internship, which I went to do in North Carolina, um, turned out to be my full-time job, which is the one that took me to, to London All right. uh, for training. Yeah, that was Deutsche Bank. And then for training, and then I came back and worked there for two years before moving to Silicon Valley. However, how do you prepare for that? I think um, if you're a freshman, or a sophomore, if you don't get an, if you're especially in computer science, so whichever field you are in, please, 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 over the summer, usikai to, usikai to on campus. I mean, don't just sit on campus. Please make sure you have a, a an internship somewhere. Because I remember uh, the recruiters for my junior year, which was my third year, for those who don't know, they were able to talk to me because I had had some sort of real world experience in my sophomore year and that experience actually i did it in kenya it was an unpaid internship but i was working for some small company so sometimes it takes making sacrifices like those just to set yourself up for the future so make sure, first thing i would say is make sure you have an internship i I didn't have like a solid internship in my freshman year. I just worked on campus on some summer, you know, summer program. But once you know that this is the path that you want to do, please, 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 from freshman year, try as much as you can to get a, some sort of, you know, real world experience, basically through an internship uh, in your freshman year. 
at the very least, if you miss out on freshman year, sophomore year, that is like non-negotiable because your sophomore year will set you up for your junior year. That's your third year just before you graduate. And your third year is what you need. You need that internship so that you can get your full-time job because it could easily convert to your full-time job or you have options to apply. At least you want to have that at the back of your mind and you don't need to stress about applying for jobs in your senior year at all. It's really harder from my experience and from what I've seen from people. It's way harder to apply for jobs after you have graduated Mm. compared to just before you graduate. So that's why I'm really, really stressing on this junior year internship. But that junior year internship does not just come. It comes from doing anything and everything you can in your freshman year and sophomore year. All right. And opportunities, I would say for, especially if you're doing STEM, I would say there's usual, there's a lot of conferences and then there's also make use of your student career services. They usually have internship opportunities. They have scholarship opportunities. Get that free funding to go do that, uh, you know, to go do that uh, internship somewhere, even if it's in Kenya, just get the internship, go to your departments, ask them, can I get funding for this? Because that's what I did for my junior year. I got from some department. I got special funding, but I still had to like, you know, support myself. I did some research for my professor to uh, part of the summer, and then I went to do the other one. So get that funding, get that unpaid internship in your freshman year, sophomore year, and then it will prepare you. In your junior year, you have to get a good internship, have to get in a, like a good company. And then you can hope and go work really, really hard so that they can actually call you back for full time because mm. they don't offer everybody full time positions. So you still got to prove yourself that you deserve that spot. And then after that, you'll be set and you can still apply. You can leverage that to apply to other things, but it's much easier to apply to something when you're not stressed than when you're stressed. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. So that's what I would I would recommend. Um, just to mention a few opportunities, there's usually NSBE, National Society for Black Engineers. Please, please go to those conferences. Even if you're in your master's degrees here in the U.S. and you're wondering you're in STEM, that, that's a very good place to get um, to get you know to get jobs to get internships. They usually there's a lot of big companies that usually come, even from Africa. By the way, I want to encourage Kenyans if you're doing this, look out for it because I have been to Nesby conferences and I've seen um, you know societies from Ghana. I don't know if I've seen Kenya, but it's it's possible. So please explore that, and this could be your chance to come to this conference and. Just sign up for their membership, join the clubs on campus. If there is none like in Kenya, reach out. I know they probably would be reaching, uh, I mean, looking to have some sort of global, you know, global, you know, presence or footprint. So reach out, see, maybe they can, if you're in University of Nairobi and watching this, maybe you can found that club and then they can bring you here and then you get to network, especially if you're in the STEM engineering fields. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one. And then for women, there's usually Anita Anita Borg or Grace Hopper Conference. Um, that's usually annual as well. And there's a lot of companies that um, encourage women, especially if that's for women in computing. But hey, go there. You never know. Yeah. Go there. So find out, find that funding somehow and go to that. And for those who are already in their you know, out in their careers. I know there's there's another conference for black, you know, black engineers. I think it's in tech. Um, black in tech, I think is what it's called. So that's usually a very good opportunity too for companies looking specifically for black engineers because they want diversity. Although I, I'm not very conversant about the market like today, today, but those are the opportunities that I have known in the past. I don't think they would fold um, based on tech, companies are going through a slight challenge but again this presents an opportunity and which is what i want to maybe we can segue into what i'm doing um yeah the consulting and i i want to challenge um kenyan you know engineers let's try to grab these jobs because i was reading an article the other day and um it was saying 
Google. I mean, unfortunately, they fired people here and then they're now starting to hire in Mexico and India. Why can't we make that in Kenya? Okay, I know there's a lot of politics, but at the end of the day, you have to show that you can do the work. If you can do the work, then it's okay. So yes. it's not even about politics. Can you do the work? Can you get the work done? And I just hope and pray that one day we can be one of those hubs that they want to substitute or like they want to show or like share, you know, opportunity or they want to grow or over there. But if we cannot show that we can do the work, then that's, that's, that's a big challenge. Yeah. I know there's a lot of issues with compensation and we can go into that and the politics and all that, but we can just we can try and i guess what i do now i do tech consulting and sometimes i have some overflow work and i really really try so hard please don't don't send me too many <laughs> applications for jobs because i don't have them but i try so much whenever i have a project to get like a kenyan to do some of the work for me because i'm not always and i think you can bear witness <laughs> uh, gladys on this so let's try it starts small that's how we're building um and what i do now is i get projects from different clients and then i you know i have to we have to execute i mean i have to execute on them some i work on them myself some i'm not able to get enough time so i hire somebody and I really, really try not to go on Upwork and hire somebody that I don't know. I really try to get a Kenyan, yeah. <laughs> a Kenyan engineer that I can trust and I know that they can do the work because at the end of the day, it's about the work being done. And if I can have my people, why not? Yeah. And I think I don't want to, I want to emphasize this because I have seen and I have worked. So when I went to Silicon Valley, I worked with a lot of Indians it's Walmart. And this is how they have built their country. You go to, a, it's a whole department and it's just them. How did they do this? You even find that they are bringing some, some more people just to come and fill up positions and they're straight from India. So we really have to start doing the same. But it starts from, we have to build capacity. We have to build, you know, we have to be able to work and get a, a good network of people and a hub Bec the reason why they're able to bring them here is because they have like Bangalore and I, I don't know all the other places they have offices there mm -hmm. but how did they set up those offices I feel like it started from them outsourcing you know work to you know engineers and then people so this is important so everybody every, it's it's almost like every Indian you meet here it's if they're not in tech, I don't know. <laughs> like, for the most part, where I have been, where I have worked, even at Deutsche Bank, all these top tech companies, and that's why they have risen all the way to, you know, CEOs. Um, for Google, Microsoft, I think they're all Indians. Um, so just, we have to build our, you know, our community too. <laughs> and it starts this way. So... I challenge, you know, if we are in this part of the world, if we are privileged, let's send, let's try to get engineers out there back home. And if you're back home, please build the capacity so that and make yourself available and actually do the work. Please, and actually do the work. <laughs> no, yes. You, Janet, you actually touched, and I'm happy you, you, you talked about that. What is the name of the, and you mentioned that you're now doing tech consulting. What's the name of, yes. is this like your, your thing, your, your company? What is the name? Yes. There, we, we have so many computer science students, software engineers in Kenya. For those who are capable and they build capacity and they want to get in touch with you or check opportunities that you have, where should they be checking? Wow. And I, I knew this is where I'm putting myself in. <laughs> And hot soup. Yes. Because, well, I pray, honestly, pray for me so we can get more contracts. If I can get more contracts, I am pushing them over to you guys. Okay. So, But the name of my company is JW Tech, um, jwtechconsultancy.com. Uh, so I created it with my, along with my husband. He's a security engineer. Um, and so we work together on tech tech-related contracts um, and sometimes outsource. So he does security. I do most of the software and coding. Okay. So that's our company. Uh, currently, I don't have any jobs open. 
But if I do, I, I mean, it doesn't hurt. I will. You can reach out to Gladys if you know, like, you have built capacity, or reach out to Gladys who will reach out to me and tell me, okay. And then I'll keep you in the back of my mind. I, I may have a project here and there, and who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. But let's build capacity and actually show that we have it and make it available. And let's let's actually do the work. Yes. I feel like that's the biggest, biggest challenge. I know. I yeah. know. I know. We tried. I like, like you know, we were trying to build an app for the startup that we are running. And my goodness, yeah. it was so hard getting someone professional to do to do the job. So I agree. If you get an, an opportunity, it represents us very well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And now, now that uh, it is a very good opportunity to also look in all these other things you are doing. Okay, can we start from, I don't know, can we just start from maybe motherhood first and foremost, because you mentioned. Oh, wow. And then, because yes. that is connected to your passion, you, you are passionate about women empowerment. And I think maybe let's just talk about all the fact that you're a, a mother and then where women empowerment kind of comes comes in and all those other three spheres that you mentioned that you you were you you were passionate about. <laughs> Thank you. Um so yeah, like you said, I have four things that I, I I think at some point I came up with it, like maybe two, three, four years back, I'm a five years. There were Africa, I really love Africa. I really love entrepreneurship and that's why you see me talking about, you know, my tech consulting and I have also tried out <laughs> a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> um and I am passionate about women empowerment and the last two I said Africa, women empowerment, entrepreneurship and Tech. Wait, Africa, tech. Okay, so tech, Africa, women empowerment, and entrepreneurship. Yes. So those are the four things that I love. Um, and I, I think everything I do kind of revolves around that. And you've asked a very important question. <laughs> yes, I'm a mother of two. Um, two wonderful kids. I love them to death. <laughs> I would sacrifice the world for them. Uh, so one is two and a half, that's my daughter, and the other one is just two months now, maybe two and a half months. So motherhood is very lovely. It, I love seeing my kids grow. I love every passion, like just seeing how they are being and sometimes just seeing myself in them or seeing their dad in them. It's, it's kind of wonder. It's kind of crazy. And how smart kids are. Actually, you'd be very surprised. We think kids don't know much, but they know a lot of things. <laughs> so it's very humbling um, experience, but it's also a lot of work. I feel like we'd never talk about this. It is a lot of work. It's a lot of sacrifice and my advice to anybody who's gonna be a mother is or wanting to be a mother one day is take your time until you are ready and then because you'll need to give it your all and if you're a mother let's try to give it our all motherhood is very involving it's very um it's almost like you have a dependent on i mean you have a dependent somebody who's very dependent on you 100% every decisions they make anything they do but also you kind of balancing being there and also just let them be because it's sort of a balancing act so I think for me I'm really enjoying being a mother and um and just having a wonderful you know partner my husband his name is Wilson and how he's so helpful I mean he sacrifices a lot <laughs> for all of us just like I do and just being there for my kids and for those again like I said if you're looking to be a mother make sure you have a very good partner because this is not a one-person job I, I applaud all the single mothers you know I don't know how you did it I don't know how you still do it but hats off to you all through all through that and for all the mothers like me going through this I know you got it you know I wish you well <laughs> yeah we got this um and for those aspiring to be mothers it's it's a really wonderful thing but make sure you are ready for it um it takes a lot from you i think i remember um before we used to travel a lot and now that has changed because you kind of have to take care of the kids and then still find time for yourself which we still try to uh but it's it's a lot of balancing 
but i feel like god gives us a lot of grace so i don't want to make it like it's oh it's it's so bad i think somehow you just get a lot of grace and you just take it as it is and enjoy i try to enjoy the moment i try to live the moment even with my kids it's really wonderful and when you play with them you get to become a kid again and you just it's like you get lost in their world and so i guess for me being a mother and like women empowerment <clears throat> Mostly before it has been seeing and trying to encourage women to join the tech industry. I think I had mentioned before that I used to do um, coding, um, coding classes for kids, especially minority kids and especially girls and trying to encourage them to join the, you know, the tech path. And that's really, really my passion. Lately, I think I am getting you know as you go through you know pregnancy motherhood you don't you don't find i feel like we don't appreciate enough about what women go through and even especially in pregnancy and just birth process and you know nursing a baby and i think i am slowly finding interest in that i i haven't done much about it but i i just i feel like we should talk more about it Tell us about the, you've talked about the women empowerment. Tell us about the entrepreneurship uh, stuff that you are doing. Yeah, for entrepreneurship, oh goodness. I think I have done so many things. I've tried so many things and this is, you know, um, that's why I was saying, if you want to start a family, just take your time because if try to explore as much as you can, try, try as many things, maybe before you get to your 30 to, 30 years of age or something try like the world is for the living you owe it to yourself to try and if you don't try you just live with regret so for me i my entrepreneurship journey actually started at tufts i i i was a founder i still am a founder of this uh startup it's called uliza and what we were trying to do is to create basically um allow access to information through just phone calls and we were really inspired by the fact that in you know the dictionary not the diction the internet is available for everybody but it's in various languages that not everybody understands for example african languages there's a lot of people who are cut off from just access to information that's on the internet just because of their language and so our goal was to try and um, create something that uh, allows people to just call in or just use their voice and then still get access to at least the basic information. We're still, you know, as you can know, that's very, very, you know, tech heavy, a lot of data, you know, we need a lot of data to be collected, which we still are, you know, are doing or have been doing, but that's uh, what really sparked my my interest as, uh, as an entrepreneur. Um, while while at Tuft. So I worked on that on that project. It's still up and running. Um, our CEO manages and does it for the most part right now. Uh, and then I also and this was our focus was mostly in Africa and Asia. Asia. So this also comes back to my interest in Africa. Like everything I do, I really try to I kind of wanna bring back my skills to Africa where, you know, or to Kenya, to my hometown. To, like start it small and then after that i created um a company its name was donomat so what i wanted to do was to, to digitize so soko the soko experience that we all have we go to soko i don't know a specific day of the week and then we buy the clothes so i mean i grew up going to soko to buy stuff so i don't know if everybody did that but i really enjoyed that experience but i there was never any contact or you could never like return anything you could never know what's there what's not there so my goal was to digitize that and to also digitize kamasasa when you go to town you see the vibandas and they're selling clothes you can never really know what's there what's not there so that was my goal with donyamat so we started we started out in eldoret um we were able to actually onboard close to 200 plus, you know, um, sellers in Eldoret town. So that was, I, I would say that was a good, a good, um, 
success. However, there were challenges uh, working on it because as much as you want <coughs> you want sellers to upload their stuff, you also want them to maintain it and um, you want you want sellers to maintain it. And on the other side, you want buyers to also look, browse, buy and do stuff if possible. So um, we ran into a few challenges here and there, and that's why I still love entrepreneurship so much, uh, regardless of the challenges. It's not one straight path. And I think anybody who's worked in the Kenyan market or in the African space knows it's not a straight line. And so a few of the challenges that we ran into, um, for example, not getting, you know, buyers to up update no not by sellers to update their um, their profiles and just to keep that going because first of all we're onboarding people who are offline and so it, it does take quite yeah. a bit of thinking um and I, we, I put that on pause to some extent uh, and then i decided to okay you know what and also remember as you doing a startup still requires some funding so you have to dig into your own pockets which i did to do all that but hey life is for the living if you don't try what will you do so tried that um and then i went to so i decided okay you know what because that's not working let me try to figure out a way in which i can make some money and then i will still get back to it so i tried you know i bringing tea i still do it with my friend one of my friends and i partner so we sell kenyan tea over here uh our brand is called tamu life tamu life tea we i come from um a tea growing area i'm from nandi actually board of nandi and Osingishu. my parents grow tea i love tea and <clears throat> so i really wanted to see okay can i get that end product to you know consumers here in the us and i i've had some sort of success although it's very involving still going albeit very slowly but hey you know even as you still do that you have to pay your bills and you have to do that so i was doing all that well doing full-time um work and yeah yeah well doing full-time so and then um that's what I have been doing on the side. And then I now, when I quit corporate, um, the corporate world, I decided, let me create my own tech consulting. So this is part of my entrepreneurship journey. And I, I for the tea business, I gave it to my friend. We still work on it together. He does most of it uh, for now. I mm -hmm. now want to focus on my, you know, tech consulting and on the side also of being, you know, as I continue with my tech consulting, I have other hobbies and my new hobby now is just exploring my culture and my identity. And I think this comes from being a mother. And as a mother, you think, okay, I was, I, I had the privilege. I grew up with my grandmother and she taught me so much. You, I feel like we underestimate that experience a lot until you have kids and then you're like, oh, wow, they might not even ever get to know about this thing that I did that I think was very cool or very informative and so lately i am um you know i'm trying to do documentation especially of my culture but i hope to expand it to other cultures um and just so they can see it and even if they will not adopt it or it will not be there we can still have you know remnants of what our people used to do and i think i'm very inspired to do this as well because if you don't know your identity I feel like it's very easy to get lost and we see this um i mean not in a bad way i say this very humbly and um with gratitude that i i know where i come from but you see african americans they tr they are also trying to go back to africa trying to find their roots you also find people in the caribbean trying to do the same and trying to just find some sort of identity and also i have had the privilege to interact with kids or just ad young adults here who did not grow up I, I, uh, I guess did not grow up in Africa and you just find them like it's kind of their lost especially first generation you know immigrants here you find you just find them that 
they want but there's nothing they can identify with and maybe what i will be doing and documenting i know i will be starting with kalenjin because that's what i know but i hope to expand this and um just bring some of that knowledge so they can at least learn maybe have a starting point or at the very least if no one is interested in millennia or in our, i don't know how many years to come there will be some sort of reference for our cultures which are very very quickly fading away especially with a lot of changes urbanization and all that kind of stuff so yeah i have my youtube channel coming up i uh for this it will how i will be interviewing some of the really old people that we still have like every day i just feel like oh my god i should have been i should have done this because sometimes i reach out and i'm told oh so and so passed so and so passed. and it's like oh you know they say when an old person dies it's like a whole library dies with them <laughs> a whole library burnt down and I, can we just maybe try this is my small contribution to that and i i hope to you know exploit and make it make it work i i encourage anybody yeah. and everybody else out there if you are listening and you can do it, something for your culture for your tribe i think we should have it when you look on youtube and you look for african specific even like taita or i don't know embu meru Kikuyu, maybe Kikuyu, there is one to Kalenjin, like all our tribe, Luya, Luo, do we have content? Most times, not at all. But look look for Hindi, you'll even find like the Indians, like specific cultures, you find Chinese. They have, at least Chinese, they are well documented because they had a written language. Ours was oral, we're not passing it down to our kids. Do you know like your cultural songs what did they used to sing nowadays i think i reflect about on this a lot because when i think oh what would what did my people sing for my kids you know to sleep what are the lullabies and i'm like i'm so blank and mm. you you and you just think of situations like those and you're like should i just be singing you know, the wheels on the bus go round and round all the time. And then I, I think one of my other aha moments came when we sing a lot of these English songs. For example, a ring, a ring, a, round, a ring, a ring of roses, a pocket full of roses, something like that, without knowing yeah. meaning, actually that carries a lot of history of the UK of, of, of Europe because there was a time there was a plague and they, they were forming like rings or something, something to do with that. So like these children's songs carry history from other tribes. What about us? Where is our history? And I think that's just something that's been lately fascinating me. <laughs> and mm. my YouTube channel is coming up. I'll be interviewing some good people um, soon. It's called the Cultural Compass. It's my culture, my heritage, my identity, and my future. So basically, that's what I, I'll be doing soon. Perfect. We will be watching out. You will. I'll, I'll put all the links down below. And guys who are interested can keep checking on your stuff. And I'll also connect you. I have a friend who is super passionate about recording our culture, at least the, the little that we, we now know, because I think we've not retained a lot because we've kind of disconnected a little bit from our cultures and our languages and all those things. But he is trying to write it in form of a book. I think you guys will have a very yeah so i'll connect awesome. to you. I'll connect him and um you are doing so many things janet too many. and actually i wanted too to many. ask because because you too many no it's good so it's it's good to explore like we we all have all these sorts of interests mm -hmm. yeah it's good to explore whenever you can yeah so i want to mention i was actually wanted to ask um because i you hosted me in one of the kalenjin platforms mm -hmm. i'm not sure is that, is that is that connected to what you are about to to do even with your youtube channel no actually what we used to do is what you're doing but it was mostly for not for i think what you you have been masters phd a little bit although i don't have any of those <laughs> 
but we were still trying to explore and see other people's journeys and where they are in this world and how they got there and just inspiring people so it's not okay it's not connected it was purely in kalenjin although we did have some guests in swahili and i and that's why i'm very very excited for you to you know take take up that that um that mantle as well and yeah. even doing it better doing it for everybody in 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 english for us we were following like kalenjin people uh we went that's where we started but we were um, yeah we'll see if we yeah. will yeah. be back but it's called again tap kalenjin um it means what do you see you kalenjin person something that's direct yeah. translated <laughs> Yeah. No, I enjoyed I really enjoyed myself in the show yeah. and and that is where we connect quite a bit. Yeah. But yeah, so it was an honor it was such a great honor to have you there. Thank you. You inspired a lot yeah. of no. I still meet people and that's why I want to shout out to you for doing this. Um uh you never know who you inspire. I met I mean I I've never met this person, but he occasionally chats with me on on our facebook and tells me you know what i so thank you so much for your program it's through this that he was able to go to the uk and he's tell me he's doing well and when you meet such people you're like you know what mission accomplished so I, i'm i'm you know i'm very excited for you and to see people you know inspired by you and just you never know who you touch even if it's one person that's a that's a whole generation change that's one that's my that's you know that's what i believe so keep it up keep it up i'm very excited for you janet with all these so first of all uh, um, all the best with the youtube channel i'll be looking forward to to watching and supporting you on that um yeah. but I, i i just have one last question before we end this so from all saying somewhere in nandi county through alliance girls to the US uh, to Bay Area to Tufts first of all Tufts University and then to uh, to the bank and then to Bay Area to all the things you are currently doing what is one lesson you've learned I think one lesson I have learned is it says be fearless in the pursuit of what sets your soul on fire so i think i think that's 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 the lesson that i have learned and it's if your heart tells you to do this i think more more so you know the universe just kind of you know conspires for you for the good and at least at the very least if you fail you learn something that's what i have always told myself because in some of those ventures like i was telling you earlier what have i not tried i've tried so many things a lot has failed but i have learned a ton of things i have learned a ton of things so if anybody is trying to build a business or like is an entrepreneur out there i salute you because i know the journey is not easy it's tough um, but we keep on going on we keep on keeping on because we can't give up and sometimes we just know um our humanity depends on it but it's also good to know when to exit like i've said you know i had to put aside donya mad because of the challenges i was facing you have to know when to exit and i think that's that's a very 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 important important topic but at the very least you walk away with a lot of lessons learned so that's one thing i would say i have learned and then perseverance and hard work the the universe will always conspire for you i know i have been lucky I've been fortunate um and maybe not everybody's privileged like that but I believe they there is something for everybody in this life there's there's a place for you I mean it might be really really hard and I know times in Kenya right now could be very challenging and seem like nothing is working but what does your heart tell you can you follow your passion I think if you follow your passion you're able it kind of helps you get through the hard times um and with that you can you know you can survive even you know the turmoils and the ups the downs i want to also um you know encourage more people in kenya let's and um, can we venture into entrepreneurship and for those of us who are out here maybe we can think of how can we invest instead of not just building 
um inaitwa nini uh building rentals we can invest in young people who are actually doing serious things i know a few people who moved back from the us to kenya and they are doing like really really good job um building some building a business building or trying things out and i am so grateful to you know have some of those people around and just to be able to look at them and be like wow i admire you and that that keeps me going too <laughs> um uh the other thing is <clears throat> no matter where you come from let that not define you it's just if you have a goal that you have is defined just go for it um i would say this because even as a lands like you saw it's not easy you may feel like you don't belong but find your space you belong there at silicon valley i worked i maybe i didn't mention i went from dutch bank and then i went to work in for walmart that's the biggest retail um in the us and i think even all over the world employing over 1 million people a lot of people it's it's really big <clears throat> so that's why i was working i was working for their e-commerce um uh working on their e-commerce you know sector tech sector and um being there and being a minority was challenging and that's why i want to see more people in tech so like women in tech black people in tech if we can do it i know this podcast may have been too much into tech 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 but let's we have to create we have to create and own those spaces and now as we as i move on to you know black woman you know creating a tech business i know you can see and it's still challenging but i want to assert and create my space there i i know i have a space there i know i can succeed i have the brains to succeed you to have the brains and the potential no matter where you are i i think if you just I think you can always find out okay is this the right place what do i need what are the ingredients why am i failing if you're failing on something is it something i can control and if it's something you can control take that control and use it to propel yourself to power yourself to the next level so that those are the lessons that i <clears throat> I want I, I want to share or I want to say and again be fearless in the pursuit of what sets your soul on fire. Yeah. Mic drop. <laughs> we will end it there. Thank you so much Janet for making the time. I know you were busy uh, with all the things in your schedule but you made time for us so we don't take that for granted. Asante sana. Thank you. Thank you too and uh, yeah I want to say thanks for all the audience and be inspired and i want to hear a lot a lot of success from everybody thank you so much gladys for having me and i'm so humbled to be here it's been wonderful bye okay bye